Okay, for the purpose of the recording, uh, my name is Barry Adams. This is the fatherheart.tv webcast, and it is Wednesday, December the 3rd, 2014. And today, um, you know, we are in December, and I know it's probably a little early. I know the um, in North America, the, the Christmas season as such, it can be really pushed, you know, um, and, you know, you get all the Christmas songs going and, you know, we hear all the, the commercials and everything else is all about Christmas. And, and so when it, I'm talking today about uh, the, uh, the prophetic word, the, the declaration of Jesus when he, before he came to earth in, in Isaiah, <clears throat> you know, there, his name would be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so I, I do realize that, uh, I mean, it, it, while it sounds like a Christmas message, I, I really believe that it is a message that we can take to heart every day of the year. Um, it is something that, um, um, you know, Paul, that Paul said, to, I think it was to the Colossian Church, he said, you know, some people hold uh, certain uh, holidays above others and other people see every day the same. And so, you know, it's it, this is one of those messages where this is, applicable to each and every one of us every day of the year and so uh, I just want to just talk about <clears throat> the abiding presence of God that is with us all the time and really understanding the um, the real heart behind the gospel message and why Jesus came 2,000 years ago and the fulfillment of the desire of the Father to be with us so and if we look in the Old Testament, you, we, there's all kinds of scriptures, and I only took a few. I mean, you, you know, we only have a certain amount of time, but there are many scriptures that really speak about God uh, being with his people. And um, I, it, this isn't something that is only a New Testament thought. In the Old Testament, uh, there are many, many examples where God has made promises to be with his people. And uh, in Psalm 46.1, Describing God being with us, uh, I think it was David that wrote, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in, in times of trouble. So, you know, when we are in trouble, and, you know, Jesus said that in this world we will have trouble, so whether we uh, find trouble ourselves, it, it can find us, in, but uh, there is a promise that even in the, the midst of our trouble that God is a very present help. In, in Deuteronomy 4.7, um, it, it writes, and this is the NIV version, he says, What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way our God is near us whenever we pray to him? And, and I think this is one of the, 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 the very core foundational um, components of the heart of God, that he is close to us, he is near to us. And, and of course, this was a distinctive that the Israelites were able to to take for themselves that, you know, what other nation is there that has a God like our God who is so close to us when we pray? And, and of course, this is a, a promise that, that the Lord has actually repeated many times to many of his, his leaders in, in the Old Testament. But to, to Joshua, he, he said this after Moses had, had gone on to, uh, he passed away and the mantle of leadership was passed to, to Joshua. Uh, the Lord spoke to Joshua, and he said in Joshua 1, verse 5, he said, No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you nor forsake you. And I just you know, want to encourage you, and I'm encouraging me and anybody who's listening on the webcast later, that God is an ever-present help in our time of trouble. God is with us all the time. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. And I, I really believe that, um, you know, the, the kind of the crux of what I want to just say, and I'm probably going to just repeat it over and over again, and just because I think it, it bears repeating, is that there is a promise, you know, and as, as God said to Joshua, as I was with Moses, so will I be with you. And it's amazing with Moses, uh, it, the Lord speaks and he says that I, I spoke to him face to face as with a friend. And so there is this intimacy that God had with Moses in this fellowship that they had together. And he promised that he would um, be with Joshua in the same way. 
And so there's this, this, this desire, I believe, in the heart of our Father, uh, not only to be close to us, but to know that for us to know that, that he's close to us as well. And I think just the revelation of that, knowing that our Father is close to us, that he is with us, that he never leaves us, he never forsakes us, that you know he never changes, right? He's the Father of lights who has no shadows of turning, and he doesn't change like shifting shadows. He is always the same. And uh, you know, just to be able to know that and to rest in that and to be comfort comforted with that. And and one of my uh, um, favorite promises when it comes to the closeness of God is Psalm. 34 verse 18 where David writes and this is the World English Bible translation he says Yahweh is near to those who have a broken heart and saves those who have a crushed spirit and I don't know about you but you know there are times in our life where we are crushed where we experience brokenness where we um, we are walking through valleys that are very dark and it's in those times that Yahweh the Lord is close to us and he promises to save us when we're, we're feeling crushed. And I really believe the reason why God is so close to us, the reason why he has a heart for us to be reminded of that, is because he has the heart of a father towards us. In Psalm 103, verse 13 and 14, King David writes this, and he says, Like a father has compassion on his children, so Yahweh has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are made, he remembers that we are dust. And the, there is a heart, um, the dynamic in the Old Testament, which shift radically, which we're going to talk about today, but the dynamic of the presence of God in the Old Testament was different than the presence of God in the, in the New Testament. And I just picked up just one scripture from Judges 14.6 here. But in, in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God would come upon people. You know, so it, the, the Holy Spirit wouldn't be in people, but that he would come upon people. And in jo, uh, Judges 14, 6, it, it talks about um, um, uh, the spirit of Yahweh came mightily on him. And this was about Samuel, or excuse me, Samson. And he tore him as he would have torn a young goat. And he had nothing in his hand, but he didn't tell his father and mother what he had done. And it just like, you know, this was an example of what happened uh, often in the Old Testament where God would would um, uh, come, the Spirit of God would actually come upon people, right? Not in people, but upon them. And But then if we read in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 36, verse 26 to 27, there is a future promise that comes from the heart of God for uh, that we would no longer have the Spirit coming upon us and separate from us, but that we would actually have a new Spirit and a new heart. And let, let's just read this. Uh, this is a promise where God is speaking to the new covenant. And he says to Israel, I will also give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take away the stony heart of flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my ordinances and do them. And see, I really believe this is, this is the foretelling of the whole point of what I'm talking about today is that we went from the God being around us in that sense, uh, the Holy Spirit being upon us, to now God is saying there's going to be a time when not only are you going to have a new heart, I'm going to give you a new spirit as well. So there's going to be an awakening. There's going to be a new creation that happens within you. But I'm also going to give you my own Holy Spirit, that I am going to put my spirit, the, the very core of who I am, I am going to put right inside of you. And so we we see the foretelling of this, of the Messiah, which was Jesus, which would launch this whole promise into fulfillment in Isaiah 7, 14, where it's speaking about the, the coming Messiah, and it says, Therefore, this Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And we know that that uh, scripture was quoted, that was referred to in Matthew. And this is where an angel of the Lord came and visited Joseph. And, there, he, you, know, the, you know, him and Mary, you know, were engaged. And you know the story of, you know, that uh, she 
the Holy Spirit came upon her and, and she conceived a virgin birth. And, and this is the, the promise which was referred to from Isaiah where the angel comes to Joseph and says this. He says, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall give birth to a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted God with us. And so this is the big deal of the new covenant, is that God is now with us. Emmanuel is the name which means that God is not only around us, but he has now come in the form of humanity and to identify with us. And in Philippians 2, verses 5 to 8, Paul writes this to the Philippians church. He says, Have this in your mind, which was also in Christ Jesus, who ex existing in the form of God didn't consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, yes, the death of the cross. So, like, this is the most amazing thing that we could ever possibly imagine, that God himself, the Son of God, the part of the Trinity, the second person in the Trinity, he, he existing in the form of God, he actually emptying himself of all his God-like, all his God privileges, taking on the form of a servant to become in the likeness of men. And so this is so important for us to understand with the gospel is just that, that God himself, the second person of the Trinity, and the first person of the Trinity, the Father, sent his Son into the world for this to happen so that Jesus could actually share in our own humanity. It's the most amazing thing. The more that we can understand this truth, I really believe the more we, we will begin to realize how close the Lord is to us, how much he understands us, and how much he, his heart is to, to save us. And in Hebrews 2, verses 14 and 15, it talks about, uh, the, the writer of Hebrews talks about Jesus uh, coming to earth. And before this, he talks about, you know, he, he brought many children to glory, right? And in verse 14 of Hebrews 2, he continues to write, he says, Since then, the children have shared in flesh and blood. He also himself, in the same way, partook of the same, that through death he might bring him to uh, bring to nothing him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might deliver all of them who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So this is Jesus, right? This is our brother. And, and so this is the, uh, earlier on in Hebrews 2, he says that he is not ashamed to call us his brothers. And so this is the, the motivation why Jesus came, so that he would actually share in the flesh and blood, that he, he partook of the same things that we struggle with, and yet he did that. He became a man so that he could actually destroy the person, the enemy, the devil, who had the power of us over death over us and caused us to live an entire lifetime in fear. And see, this is the to me. It's amazing that our elder brother Jesus, uh, who is God, but emptied himself of God privileges to become a man, did this so he could understand us, he could identify with us, he could relate to us. And Hebrews four, verse fourteen and fifteen talk about our great high priest, and um, and I just absolutely so appreciate. The, and recently I've just been thinking about this and that how Jesus became um, clothed with, with humanity, clothed with flesh and blood. And in Hebrews 4, 14 and 15, it, it reads, Having then a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold tightly to our confession, for we don't have a high priest who can't be touched with the feeling of our infirmities but one who has been in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Now, I, I want to stop there for a second, and I, I really want to, to kind of reiterate this, that Jesus was tempted like we are in all of our feelings of infirmities, yet without sin. I don't know about you, but um, when you think of humanity, when you think about the things that I struggle with, um, 
the fears that I may have, the insecurities I might have, to be able to think that we have an elder brother, a firstborn, who is our high priest, who has actually experienced everything that we have experienced, but yet without sin, that so he can identify with us. And really, that's what really qualifies him to be such a great high priest, is because he can so identify with all of our struggles. And, and so the next verse I, I really love, because I really believe it's the whole point of the gospel, is, is that Jesus did this. He identified with us that he could be that great intercessor. And then so the next verse, which is verse 16 in Hebrews 4, says, Let us therefore draw near with boldness to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace for help in time of need. You see, the point, the reason why Jesus did what he did was that you and I do not have to feel any form of separation from God. We don't have to feel ashamed. We don't have to feel uh, somehow unworthy of approaching God because what Jesus did on the cross has made a way for you and I to draw near to God with boldness. That we can go before the throne of grace anytime, night or day, to receive mercy and find grace for help in our time of need. And that's, I really think that um, the more that you and I are able to understand in the sense that our brother, our, that God understands us because he, he has gone through what we've gone through, that he is with us, he will never leave us, he will never forsake us, and that, you know, the more that that becomes a reality, I really believe that it will help us to walk out each day, no matter what happens in our life, knowing that we are not alone. Jesus said, uh, uh, a few times in, that were recorded in the Gospels that I am not alone for my Father is with me. And so Jesus continually lived in a place of the abiding presence of God. He knew that his Father had not left him alone. And, you know, the truth is you and I are not alone. But you see, there's a strategy uh, of the enemy. You see, the enemy is defeated, right? We know that from a biblical point of reality that Jesus took away, the, uh, the, he destroyed sin and death and the devil. He, he got the keys of hell, and so we are victorious now. But the, the issue with the enemy is, is that the, the biggest tool he has for believers especially, and he does it for everybody in the world, but for believers, the, the, the power he has over us is deception. The power that he has over us is if we believe a lie and we empower the lie by agreeing with him. And in John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says, The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. And so the, the word for destroy there means to render useless. So uh, all the promises that God has for us, all the, the, re, the tangible reality of being sons and daughters to the Father, if we don't live in them, if we choose to believe the, the accuser of the brethren, if we choose to believe the one who Jesus called the father of lies, we will come into a place where we will... The, the, all the benefits and all of the, the, um, the birthright, all of our inheritance that we can enjoy and, and have um, access to this side of heaven, we can have it rendered useless. And so, of course, one of the things that uh, the serpent did in Genesis 3 when he talked to, to Adam and Eve was he questioned the goodness of God, right? So did God really say that you really shouldn't eat of the tree of life? or excuse me, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because in essence, because when you do, you're going to be like him, knowing good and evil, and he really, he feel, he's really insecure, and he doesn't want you to be that way. And so it was this hook of questioning the goodness of God, questioning his motivation, questioning God's heart, that caused Adam and Eve to believe a lie and to um, take of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the strategy that the enemy wants, one of the strategies that he really wants to try to, in a sense, sell us, right? It's not, because it's not true. It's, it's a lie. There's a different biblical reality that believers live in, but we can choose to believe in it or not. But he wants us to believe a lie that God doesn't love us and that he may abandon us at any time. And oftentimes, uh, you know, we, we know that from Father Heart Ministry, 
that uh, you know we've when we've traveled, and of course a lot of you might have had the same experiences when you've ministered. But you know when when we look at a father and we have an experience of a, a our own earthly father, it is very easy for us to uh, wrongly project that father experience on God because that's the only experience we've had as a father. So if you've had a father who left you, abandoned you, rejected you, judged you, all those things, it is easy for us to be able to buy into the enemy's lie and agree with him and think that we may be abandoned at any time, that God really doesn't love us, or maybe he loves everybody else in the world, but He, how could he possibly love us? And my encouragement to you today is that the, the truth is, is that God is closer to us than we could ever possibly imagine. In Romans 6, verse 4 to 5, this is the reality of what happened when we became in Christ. It says, We were buried, therefore, with him through the baptism to death, that just like Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we also might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, we will also be part of his resurrection. And the truth of the matter is, we are in Christ. When Jesus rose from the dead, when, and of course, when we just simply received that free gift, we became joined with Jesus. So not only now are we in Christ, like, so it's not like, um, it's like we are joined, right? And I was going to do this and I forgot, I, I was going to have an illustrated sermon and I didn't. But what I was going to do is I was going to have two glasses, half half uh, full, both glasses, and one would be water, and one would be colored colored water, like a red or, or some other color. And then when you actually pour the red into the to the uh, the clear water, they become one, right? They, you cannot separate them again. They it's like how can you take the red out of the water again and and, and make them separate? And that is the, I really believe, I know it's, it's, it fails to describe the glory and the majesty of what happened on the cross. But often, you know, when we think about our Christian life and we, we somehow feel that we are separate from God, somehow that he's left us to figure out life all, all on our own. But the truth of the matter is, is that we are in Christ and that's why we are called the body of Christ. He is the head and we are all part of his body. But not only are we in Christ, but Christ is in you. Colossians 1.27 says, To whom God was pleased to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is, this is the riches of the glory among you, is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And see, so when you think of that illustration of when you pour, say, uh, colored water into clear water, like the the thought that you could remove that colored water again is is somewhat absurd, and and the enemy will do his best to try to bring a separation in your mind between you and God. That's how God is somehow distant, or maybe you've sinned, and you know your your sin in that sense has brought separation. Now, it's true that when we sin, that there is a separation in our mind and in our conscience that we need to deal with, right? Because we feel like there's something between him and I uh, when I sin. And then that's where we confess. And it's just, but it's not about all of a sudden, you know, we're in Christ and then we're out of Christ, and then we're back in again. It's just about a restoration of relationship. That in the same way that I would say to my wife, I'm sorry I hurt you. Uh, you know, please forgive me. I I didn't mean to. It's it's that kind of thing that that when we we blow it and we do blow it, we do miss it. We do miss the mark. That but it doesn't separate us. It's not all of a sudden now God is somewhere else and He's waiting for us to to uh, rejoin ourselves. We are united with Christ and Christ is in you, and that is the hope of glory. And and the promise that Ezekiel spoke about. Uh, the spirit being in you, Jesus mentioned that in John chapter 14, verse 17, where he said, the spirit of truth whom the world can't receive, for it doesn't see him, neither knows him. You know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. And see, this is the, the, 
the the fulfillment of the prop the, the prophetic word that Jesus uh, where, where God said I will put my own spirit in you and where the Holy Spirit was upon people but not in them now Jesus before he went to the cross said to his disciples the spirit is with you right now so in the same way that the spirit would come upon people but after the cross the spirit of God would be in you and of course we know from 1 Corinthians 3:16 where, where Paul writes, don't you know that you are a temple of God and that God's spirit lives in you? And this is the, the whole point, is that God is not far away from you or me. He is not distant from us, but he actually lives right here. He This right here, in the, in the, the Bible says, Jesus said the kingdom of God is within, right? So right here in the very core of our being for believers, the triune God lives not only but Jesus lives there, of course, because we're one with Christ. No longer I that lives, Paul said, but Christ that lives in me. No longer, not only does the Holy Spirit live in us, because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, but in John 14, 23, Jesus said this, If a man loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Not only does God, the, the Son, live in, in you, and God the Holy Spirit lives in you, but God the Father has chosen to make his home in you. And so my prayer today is that, you know, just you and I would be reminded of the simple truth, the glorious union that we have with God, like God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. In John 14, when Jesus is speaking these things to his disciples before he goes to the cross, he says, in that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you and me, and I am in you and this is the glorious union this is the glorious connection that you and i have with our 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 savior and our lord jesus christ that we are joined with him we are one with him he is in us and we are in him and he is in the father and the father is in him and so the the, the father is in him and then so we are joined with jesus so that we are part of this amazing communion of the trinity we are not god in any way shape or form we are children of god but we have been opened up to this amazing union where we are no longer separate from him and so so when we one of the biggest problems i think we have in the christian life is if we have this mindset right and and i i can say that i can struggle with it too is that where we have a good day and then we have a bad day right so perhaps a good day for me would be I read my Bible I you know, felt like I was obedient I maybe whatever you know share the gospel with somebody or something happened right so I, I feel good and it seems like in those days we feel that we have more of a right to have access to the throne room of grace than the days when we have bad days and, you know, oftentimes with Christians, and, you know, I know you all have heard it before, but it's like we have a flower and we start picking petals off. And one day it's he loves me, and the next day it's he loves me not. And I really believe that in the midst of up our ups, in the midst of our downs, in the midst of our victories, in the midst of our failures, in the, in the, in the midst of our extreme joy, and in the midst of our extreme disappointment and brokenness, God never, ever leaves us. He is the same through the entire thing. He is the same in the, the mountaintops, and he's in the same in the valleys. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He is with us. God is living in us, and that is the most amazing thing. In 2 Timothy 2.13, I just absolutely love this simple scripture that Paul writes, where he just says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. And the reality is, is that God is faithful because he can't disown us because now we are joined with Jesus. Like, how do you separate the water, or the molecules of water? We are joined with Jesus. It's not in, out, in, out. And I think when we live that way in our lives, we, we, we are actually... Uh, not getting the entire benefit of the, the closeness that God has with us. He's with us in our times of trouble. He's an ever-present help. He's with us in our times of victory. He never, ever leaves us or forsakes us. And I really believe the more that you and I can to walk in that revelation, 
the more that we will have a security and a stability to walk through life. And no matter what comes our way, we are not, our world is not rocked. We are co convinced that he is with us, God is for us, who can be against us, and that we can rest in that truth. So if there's anybody here today that is listening to this or listening, um, you know, afterwards, and, and, you know, if you ever have struggled with this, this idea that God may leave you one day, that fear of abandonment, fear of separation, you know, I want to be able to encourage you and I want to pray because I really believe that God wants you to be free from the fear of being separated from him. In 1 John 4, 18, um, John writes, he says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear has punishment. He who fears is not made perfect in love. And I, I really believe that God wants to set you free and set me free from any kind of anxiety that we might have to do with him leaving us. Maybe maybe when we were kids or maybe, maybe it was a, a spouse who left us or um, you know, maybe it's a work situation where, you know, you were judged and, and fired or whatever. But, you know, maybe there's something in your heart where somebody has done something to hurt you and, and to, to leave you or to abandon you or to, to uh, separate themselves from you. And, and my encouragement, God is not that way. He has, it was always his heart right from the beginning to be joined with his people, to be close to his people, to be near um, I love how even even the lost, you know, we uh, Paul the Apostle talks to the, the philosophers on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17, you know, and he's talking about this unknown God, right? And he says to them, if you would just reach out your hand, uh, you, you can touch God up because he's not far from any of us. Even the world system, even the orphan world system, even the people who, who don't believe in him, he is closer than we could possibly imagine. For Paul goes on to say, I think it's in verse 28 of Acts 17, in him we live and move and have our being. So God is so close to us. And, you know, the gospel of, of Emmanuel that we celebrate at Christmas, God with us, Jesus taking on the form of humanity to identify with all of our struggles, all of our infirmities, so that he could become that great high priest and make a way for us to be forgiven of all our sin, for us to be united with him, joined with his glory through his sufferings on the cross, raised from the dead through the resurrection, his glorious resurrection, that we would be able to approach the throne of grace with boldness knowing that we can find help in, in our time of need. And so my encouragement to you is that this is the truth. The other things in your life that, that yell loud, right, that God is not with you, he doesn't love you, he, he's disappointed in you, he's frustrated with you, you know, he loves your neighbor but he doesn't love you. My encouragement to you is that those things do not come from the Father of Lights who does not change like shifting shadows. They come from the enemy whose only purpose is to try to get you and I to believe a lie. If we can believe that the goodness of God is at stake and that he really doesn't love us, that he, he, he's temperamental and that he'll change, he'll leave us at any time, I really believe that that's what will sow seeds in our own heart of insecurity and anxiety and, and, and be able to, to get us to not enjoy the the reality of of our life with Christ, and when and when I say this, you know, I and I, I I'm learning this more and more in the in the days that we're in now because you know we're going through, you know, um, a bit of a journey with our daughter and 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 uh, her illness, you know, and she's she's with us now and she's doing great, praise God, she's really responding well, but it's not only when we're on the mountaintops that that we can feel his love and feel his presence. I really believe, and I think it's, I, I've heard our friend James Jordan say this, that, that when the love of God eclipses everything else in our life, so that when we, the revelation of his love is so big that, that nothing can come in between us, and we know that there's no separation, that the more that you and I can live in that tangible reality, no matter what life comes 
what happens in life, that nothing can shake that. And I really believe that's why Paul the Apostle wrote in Romans 8, 35 and 36, where he talks about who shall separate us from the love of Christ, right? And he says, shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Now that does not sound like a rosy life. It doesn't sound like everything's going well. You know, I mean, I've, I've got everything, you know, everything's firing on all cylinders, so to speak, that, you know, life is going the way I planned. But even in the midst of those things, and trouble or hardship or persecution, famine, you know, like, you know, there's not enough money or nakedness or, or danger. Like, there's nothing in all creation that can rock that. And that's where he continues on in Romans uh, 8, 37 and 39 to 39. He says, no, in all these things, like all those things he mentioned, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, I truly believe that God is closer to us than we could ever possibly imagine, and nothing in creation can stop that. The, the demonic realm can't stop it. The angelic realm can't stop it. The present, your present circumstances can't stop it. Anything that happens in your un, unknown future cannot separate you and I from the love of God. No powers, no height, nor depth, nor anything else will, are able, will be able to separate us from, from the love of the Father that it was so freely given through His Son, Jesus Christ. When Jesus became us he became humanity he be took on the form of humanity human likeness to identify with us so that he could be that faithful high priest you see the pro the, i believe the, the the father's promise to us today is uh uh and this is from hebrews 13 uh the last half of the verse of verse five it says he says i will in no way leave you neither will i in any way forsake you and so my prayer today is that, that that would become a tangible reality for you and I, that we would know that he would in no way leave us or forsake us, that you, if there's any fear of abandonment, fear that he might reject you, fear of disappointment, that you would know that your father has, has linked his heart to you for eternity. For every person who has said yes to Jesus, for every person, there is a response that we need to make, right? It says in John chapter 1, as many as received him, to them he gave the power, the right to become children of God. So there is this, this decision that we need to make by faith to receive the free gift of Jesus' life. But when we receive that gift by faith and we, we actually have his spirit come in us, we get a new heart and a new spirit and he puts his own spirit in us. It is a sealed deal. He loves us. He will be with us through every uh, step of the way, good days, bad days, you know, victories and defeats. He will never leave us. So I just want to pray now that, uh, it, you know, just for strengthening, the Bible says that the prophetic is for, for strengthening and encouragement and comfort. So, Father, I want to pray right now for all my brothers and sisters who are listening to this message around the world. Anybody who feels like they're, they're discouraged, anyone who feels like they're separated from you, that you, they don't sense your presence, they don't feel your abiding love, they, they, they are feeling alone. Father, I pray right now by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would just pour out a greater outpouring of your love into their hearts than they could ever dream possible that as paul prayed in ephesians chapter 3 that that god would strengthen our inner man by the spirit and that we would be rooted and grounded in love and that god would give us the power to grasp how big and how wide and how long and how high his love is and that we would be filled with the full measure of the fullness of of, of god and, and i just pray for the reality of that i pray that that our Christian life would not be based on on our emotions that can can um, sometimes deceive us, 
that our Christian life, our relationship with you, living in love would not be based on upon our circumstances, that when we have bad things happen, that somehow uh, your promises have changed. Father, I just pray for just the, just like an underpinning of your love that would go deep into the soil of our hearts, Father, that we would just know that we're loved and that we would be steadfast and we would know that the steadfast love of the Lord never, ever changes that you never change and that your commitment to us has never changed. You are unwavering. Even when we are faithless, you remain faithful because you cannot disown yourself. So, Father, I just pray for for our, our kids, uh, your kids, <laughs> around the world, that, that they would just know that they're loved today. They would know that they're not alone, that even when they don't feel your presence, you are there. It's The truth is you're carrying us at the times when we feel like we are just uh, all by ourselves. So, Lord, I just pray for uh, just a deeper awareness of that today. I pray, Father, that there would be healing for people who have been abandoned, people who have been rejected by by uh, people in their lives, and that has seeded this fear of abandonment, fear of rejection, fear of separation from God. I just pray for healing to come now. I pray for the bomb of Gilead, the healing of God, to come into the areas of your life where you have been hurt, where people have... Uh, have uh, rejected you and caused you to be afraid that God would do the same. So, Father, would you, I just pray by the power of your spirit that you would just, just give us the, a sense of that there's nothing, that we would be, like Paul said, I am convinced that nothing will separate me. We need to be convinced. And it sounds like maybe Paul was convinced over a period of time. And I just pray that, that we would be convinced more today than we were yesterday, that you love us that you are for us, that you will never leave us, and that uh, no matter through thick and thin, you are with us right to the end, because you are our God and you are our Father. Thank you, Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, for coming to the earth 2,000 years ago, becoming, taking on the, the cloak of humanity, so that you would be suffer the temptations that we have suffered, yet without sin, so, but you could be a faithful high priest so that you could understand everything that we're going through. Well, so that we could come home, that you are the way to the Father, but it, you are the way for the Father to come to us as well. So Father, I just pray now for the revelation of that union that we have with the Godhead, that we are joined with Jesus and he is one with you. We are in Christ. And Christ is in the Father, and the Father is in Him. Wow. So thank you, Papa. Thank you for this revelation. Thank you that we can rest in this the rest of our lives, and throughout eternity, we are never, ever, ever going to be alone. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen.